Hello guys and welcome back to Ginger Undersea for another shark talk. Today we're going to be talking about the most famous shark, the one that puts sharks on the map but also causes a lot of fear in people. It's the best known shark in the world. We're going to talk about the Great White. So let's dive straight in. Okay, so first of all, a couple of general facts about the great white sharks. Its Latin name is Carcharodon carcarius, and it is in the mackerel sharks family or the lamniforms. So they are actually quite closely related to similar looking sharks like the makos and the poor beagles, but then also they're quite closely related to quite different looking sharks such as the sand tiger shark and the very different shark in behavior, the basking shark, which is actually the second biggest shark in the world. They're, they're very close cousins, but actually behave in extremely different ways. And also it is one of the closest known existing relatives to the extinct Megalodon shark. So great white sharks generally grow to around three and a half to five meters long with females generally growing larger than the males. And the largest great white shark ever measured was seven meters long. Now there have been reports of many other great white sharks being larger than seven meters, but no one ever officially got to measure them. But who knows, there could be larger than seven meter great white sharks out there swimming in the ocean today. Now the great white shark is the largest predatory shark in the ocean. The only two larger sharks than the great white shark is the basking and the whale shark. And both of these aren't considered predatory, even though they are still carnivorous, but they are filter feeders. So they don't actively predate on their food. The great white shark's diet consists of pinnipeds or seals and sea lions as adults, but they also get a large chunk of their diet from carcasses and other dead animals floating in the ocean that they will scavenge off. Now, interestingly, it is well known that juveniles and adolescent great white sharks actually eat uh, fish up until they are adults and old enough to prey on the larger food source of seals and sea lions. Now, recent research actually interestingly showed that, that juvenile grey white sharks, even though they do eat fish as their large proportion of their diet, in fact, a huge proportion of their diet actually comes from bottom dwelling fish and rays, which is really interesting considering how much their diet changes from bottom dwelling fish when they're young up to surface dwelling mammals as they get to adulthood. So even though there are still a lot of questions about great white sharks that we don't know the answer to yet, great white sharks are actually one of the most researched species of sharks in the world. Now this is probably due to their very high profile, everyone knows about them, everyone wants to learn more about them, and also they're very large and charismatic sharks, and there is a lot of money in great white shark because of the, the tourism industry and the diving and the general interest in great white sharks. So there's a bit more money that probably funds that research, which means that we get a lot of research in the great white shark area. This means there's been some really interesting and exciting discoveries in the field of white shark science. For example, in 2008, scientists predicted that the gray white shark may well have the strongest, most powerful bite of any living animal. Now this research was done using digital reconstruction as I guess it wasn't that easy to be able to put a machine in a great white shark's mouth so that it could bite down and we could measure its bite strength. But this reconstruction did give them an idea of just how powerful these bites of great white sharks could be. And another really interesting piece of research that has come out in the last few years is the fact that great white sharks do actually swim inside kelp forests. Now, for years, it's been thought that great white sharks stay outside of kelp forests and therefore the seals and sea lions that swam around that area were safe when they were within the kelp forest. However, using cameras that were attached onto the dorsal fin of some great white sharks, scientists actually got the first ever footage of great whites actually swimming in amongst the kelp forest and actually possibly hunting and predating on the seals while in this very densely uh, packed environment. Now, great whites are most famous probably because they're one of the most dangerous species of shark in our oceans and they have been responsible for the most unprovoked shark bites around the world in history. But just to put this in perspective, there have only been 52 fatal bites to humans by white sharks in the last 120 years around the world. Okay, so this is a minute number. If we think about the number of people that have interactions with white sharks are, and are in the oceans, 
and around the world every year for the last 120 years. So the risk is still very, very small. However, the vast majority of attacks that do happen between white sharks and humans is almost always a case of mistaken identity. Now you can see from these photos here, a, a surfer paddling out in the surf from below looks very, very similar to a sea lion or a seal on the surface. And great white sharks always attack from below. So from below, you can see how similar we look. In fact, it's a testament to the intelligence and the incredible senses of these sharks that there aren't more shark bites considering how much we look like their prey source and how much we act like an injured animal when we're in the water. Now there is a new theory that due to the fact that almost all shark bites on surface by white sharks have actually been done by sharks that are less than three meters long, therefore possibly adolescent sharks. That actually, this is young, almost adult sharks that are just in that transition phase from eating fish to moving on to their large mammal diet. And therefore they're actually still learning the ropes of their new diet and still learning to identify species. So even more, this backs up the fact that majority of bites that happen from great whites are in fact mistaken identity and the vast majority of them do not um, result in fatalities. Now I cannot emphasize, emphasize enough the risk of being bitten while in the ocean is immeasurably small in most scenarios around most of the world. However there are certain areas where the risk is higher and also certain aspects and certain conditions which do significantly increase your risk of encountering a great white shark in a negative way and we're going to talk about those factors in a later video about how to avoid negative shark interactions. Now great white sharks are considered vulnerable on the IUCN red list and are also listed on the appendix 2 of the CITES convention which means that their trade is regulated and you must have the correct permit to trade any part of a great white shark which is a very good step in the right direction as this makes international trade of these species much much harder and really restricted and therefore less appealing to a lot of people and it is thought that due to this protection numbers in some local areas are bouncing back and increasing however as stated on the IUCN red list website generally worldwide it is thought the great white shark numbers are still in decline now the reason that it is thought that some local numbers may be rising not only due to the direct protection of the white sharks in that area so they're not getting fished and getting killed as often by humans but also due to the increased protection of the local pinnipeds now in the 70s and 80s when there was huge amounts of protection uh, put in place for seals and sea lions around the coasts of different continents including america and australia and south africa and therefore allowing pinniped numbers to recover rapidly providing a much larger food source for adult white sharks and therefore the the white shark populations could flourish in this area with a huge amount of food at their disposal now one of the only threats to sharks that isn't man-made is the threat of orcas their only natural predator and this is really interesting and has become big news recently particularly in south africa as a local population of great white sharks have all but disappeared in a very short period of time. And a lot of theories are putting this down to the arrival of two specific orcas that have arrived in the area, lovingly named Port and Starboard for the side that they always swim compared to each other and the flop of their dorsal fin. Now, there have been a few great whites that have washed up on the beaches of uh, South Africa with their livers eaten which is a, a huge sign that these orcas are the ones that predated on these great white sharks to eat their livers but this can't account for all of the sharks in the area just disappearing however it is thought that just through the presence of these orcas being there and the predation of just a few of the great whites has caused a lot of the other great white sharks in the area to head offshore and possibly into deeper waters where they are safer from predation of orcas now this brings us on to general protection of sharks and what we can do to help protect sharks around the world. Now, the first thing you can do to help protect sharks is become an eco-tourist and go and shark dive and experience sharks in the wild. Anytime we get in the water with sharks, we pay to see sharks in the wild, in their natural environment, alive. We are showing governments and industries that sharks are worth much more alive than dead and therefore they are more likely to protect these species in their country and around the world. 
but we do have to make sure when we participate in ecotourism of sharks, we need to make sure that the companies we go with are putting the sharks' well-being and the health of the ecosystem first, and they are not just doing this for money. So check that they are following guidelines. Whichever species you're diving with depends on the guideline that you should be uh, following. Make sure those companies are following those guidelines strictly, and hopefully that some of that money is going back into shark protection and the local economy and local protection of the ecosystem. And the second thing you can do to help protect sharks is reduce or remove seafood from your diet. Now it's recently been suggested that actually overfishing has overtaken shark finning as the number one source of shark death around the world. Okay, and this is due to either fishing them out deliberately for their meat or for their fins or other shark products, but also from bycatch, where the sharks are caught in a method of fishing which is trying to catch another fish such as tuna or swordfish. So by reducing our seafood and making sure that any seafood you do have in your diet is sustainably caught using sustainable methods such as pole and line which has very low bycatch level and also ensuring we're not eating shark that's been renamed as anything else and you can check what some of the names are that they use in my other video on how to protect sharks that I'll pop up here. But by doing these two things, by investing money in shark ecotourism and then also not investing money in the seafood industry, which is the number one cause of shark death around the world, we can really start to protect these species and make sure that we all have plenty of sharks in the ocean to see and to keep our oceans healthy for a long time to come. Thank you so much for joining today, guys. I hope you enjoyed. If you got some value out of this video, please click the like button below and don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more shark information, marine biology, and awesome diving videos. And I'll see you at the next one.